pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that we have to open our eyes today and come to your sanctuary. We want your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love, peace. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The text for today is found in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Let me read that Bible verse, which says, The mystery that had been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now is disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Just in this Bible verse, we find two times the word mystery. And by definition, mystery is something that is difficult or is impossible to understand or explain. And as we start reading the Bible, we find different mysteries. And let me refer a couple of them to you today. The first one is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the verse 51. Paul is talking about the resurrection. Paul is talking about the changing, the transformation. And he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. This is a mystery. We cannot explain how that going to happen. But when Jesus Christ comes back for a second time with power and glory, those who die will be resurrected. And those who are still alive will be changed. I don't know how that can be possible. But there is something I know is that for God there is nothing impossible. The second mystery is found in the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 and the verse 7. And this is what some theologians call the mystery of lawlessness. And I read the verse. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. This is called the mystery of the sin. And it's impossible to understand. It's impossible to explain how in a beautiful universe, perfect, in a place called heaven, which is perfect, in a perfect creature, an angel, the sin started in his heart. And we cannot understand how the scene started. But trying to explain that will be equal to try to justify the sin. And there is no justification for the sin. It shouldn't exist never. But the third mystery is called the mystery of godliness. And I call this mystery as the antidote, the cure, the medicine that God provides for the first mystery that I've just previously, previously mentioned, the mystery of lawlessness. And it's called the mystery of godliness. And it's found in the book of First Timothy chapter 3 and the verse 16. And Paul says, indeed, and some version says, beyond all the questions, the mystery of godliness is certainly great. What is that mystery? And Paul proceeds now to explain a little bit. And he says, talking about Jesus Christ, that he was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit. And he appeared to angels and was announced to Gentiles 
and he was believed in the world and taken up in the glory. So this mystery is the antidote for the sin. But this mystery is closely related to the most beautiful story ever told. And that beautiful story, the most beautiful story ever told, is the story of the nativity. It's far away from us in time and space and location. A little bit more than 2,000 years ago, and 8,000 miles away from this, this place, this story took place in a small village called Bethlehem, the city of King David. But through the years, this amazing story brought to the humankind joy, happiness, and of course, the opportunity of a new beginning for this world. Many found through the years and centuries inspiration in this historical narrative. And some were inspired to write beautiful poems, like Charles Wesley, who wrote this beautiful poem, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let me read that a little bit. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinner reconcile. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hell incarnate deity, please as men with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Mild he lays his glory by, born that men no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. But others found inspiration to compose beautiful and sublime melodies, sweet melodies. And others found inspiration to paint. And this is the case of Rembrandt. As you can see in this picture, which is called the Adoration of Shepherds, painted in 1646. It's a beautiful painting. It's portraying a family moment which is interrupted only by the presence or the visit of some shepherds. Those shepherds were in the fields taking care of the flock when an angel appeared and said to them, Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then suddenly a band of angels appear to sing their anthem. And you know that beautiful song. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. Now, if you see the picture of Rembrandt, you see all these shepherds who enter from entering in the stable from the left side in this room. But the shepherds are filled with great joy. They are jubilant. They are exultant to be in the presence of Jesus. It couldn't be other way, because when we are in the presence of Jesus Christ, our hearts are filled with peace and joy. Now, Rembrandt found himself playing again with light and darkness. 
Maybe this is Rembrandt's trademark. But there is something important, and there is a powerful reason why Rembrandt is painting the darkness and just the light is coming from the baby Jesus. And maybe Rembrandt wanted to make sure that we remembered that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. After all, Jesus said about himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And John chapter 1 says about Jesus, In him was life, in the life, in the life was the light of men. Now, as we continue in this beautiful story, we can see that in the manger, this light was bright for the whole humankind. There was opportunity of a new beginning. But this light really was lit years and years before of that moment. And I was reading the book, Potterks and Prophets in the chapter four, and let me read something that Ellen G. White says about this. The fall of men fill all heaven with sorrow. The world that God has made was blighted with the curse of sin and inhabited by beings doomed to misery and death. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose up before him. And there is something that just give me, gives me sometimes when I read this goosebumps in my whole body because it says that Jesus Christ decided to come and save the world that fall in sin. But divine love and con had conceived a plan whereby men might be redeemed. The broken love of God demanded the life of the sinner. And in all the universe, there was but one who could, in behalf of men, satisfy it, its claims. And then before the Father, He, Jesus Christ, pleaded in the sinner's behalf, while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. Long continue was that mysterious communion, the counsel of peace for the fallen sons of men. And listen, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth. For Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Who knows how many years before the creation of this world? A thousand years, million years, I don't know, but in the eternity, this council decide to create a plan to save the men in case of sin. And you know the story of our first fathers. And then Jesus Christ appeared. Now let me tell you something about this commitment of God. This commitment of God with the humanity was conceived to last forever. Jesus became one of the human family and he will retain his human nature as a pledge that God will Fulfill his word. Therefore, Jesus, brothers and sisters, 
is the perfect bridge between God and man. That's why Jesus Christ is the perfect channel, perfect bridge that can unite us with God. He is reconciling us with God. And only someone who knows how deep is the love of God. Only someone who knows how intense is the love of God. But at the same time knows exactly what is the problems that we face in this world. Someone who knows what is sadness. Someone who knows what is fear. Someone who knows what is to be betrayed will be the only one who could fulfill this task for the humanity. And that's Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's why we celebrate Christmas, to remember what He did for us. Now, as you know, one of the most memorized Bible verses is the one that we found in John chapter 3 in the verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Other version says the begotten son of God. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal, eternal life. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Because if, you, because if you just did that, there's guarantee that you will enter in the eternal life. Now, the word used in this Bible verse in Greek is the word monogenes, which is a word that has two different roots. The first, one, the first one is mono or monon in Greek, which means only or alone, without companion. And the second root of this word is the word ginomai, which means to become, to arise, but also can be used to appear in history. So monogenes is pertaining to being the only one of its kind of class, unique in kind. And there is nobody in the universe like Jesus Christ, who is, who is man, but also is God, God with us. Jesus Christ is the only one in the universe in kind, in class. Jesus is unique. Now, how important is this for us to know that he is unique, one of his class? Well, this is very important. As you remember the book of Revelation, chapter 5, John is looking at this vision there's a big meeting in the heaven. The Holy Spirit is present. The Father in His throne. Angels. Millions of millions of them. In that place. The 24 elders. The four beings. Everybody is in the heaven. And then suddenly in the meeting. An angel asks a question. This question is. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls? And John says, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scrolls or even look inside it. Nobody. And nobody, I, I just feel like everybody at the angels start looking over the shoulders to see if someone can answer that question Nobody, John is present looking at this situation and he started to cry. Tears are start coming from his eyes. How could be that nobody is worthy in the whole universe? And he started weeping. 
And someone behind him touched his shoulder and said to him, one of the elders, John, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. But John then started cleaning his eyes, started cleaning his eyes from those tears. And then he heard about the lion of Judah, but he didn't see a lion. He said in his words, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. And brothers and sisters, the unique, the only one, Jesus Christ, the lion and the lamb is the one in his kind who can do it. The only one who can save the world. Now, I want you to think about Jesus Christ as a hero. We are looking at TV sometimes, or we watch movies, or we know about stories about different kind of heroes. There is even some heroes that they can see through the walls. Some of those heroes can fly. Some of them have so much power that they can lift a train with one hand. But they're all fictitious. They're all fake. The one and the real hero is Jesus Christ. And that's your hero, that's my hero, representing you and representing me in heaven. Now, let's go back in time. Because this light of hope was lit millions probably or thousands of years before the creation. In the book of Luke, in the chapter 2, we have this story about the moment when Jesus was born in the manger. But it happened on God's time. Everything has time in our life. Sometimes we ask questions to God. When, O oh Lord? When this suffering will be end? When this pain will pass? And it's in the time of God only. And in the story of the nativity... We find in Galatians chapter 4 and in verse 4 the following. But when the time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law. Now, according to the book of John in the chapter 1, we all know that Jesus Christ was, is the creator and the one who sustains everything in the universe. Everything exists by his word, by his will, and by his power. And he take, takes care of, of everything of, and everybody. Even those little birds in the mornings when you wake up and you hear them singing to the Lord, thanking saying thanks to the Lord for the food and for an, another beautiful day. He's taking care of those little birds. But also, the creator of those birds and the one who cares for them is the one who keeps the sun burning in the middle of our solar system. Hydrogen, helium, carbon and oxygen burning to 27 million Fahrenheit degrees in temperature. Actually, our heart can feed 1.3 million times in the sun. And it's burning the equivalent of 100 billion tons of dynamite every second. That's a lot. 
And that's controlled by Jesus Christ. The one who feeds the birds, the one who keeps the sun in the center of the universe, of the, the solar system, I said, is the one who cares for you too. The one who cares for your everyday tasks and problems and obstacles that you have to face. The one who cares when you're happy too. The one who loves you with so much intensity. This creator and the one who sustains everything. In the chapter 2 of Luke, he became a baby. The one who sustained everything. Now he depends on a woman to be fed. The one who feeds the birds. Now he is in the manger to be fed by his mother. The one who keeps the sun burning. The one who keeps everything in its place. Now he needs warm arms to sleep tight during the nights. Everything depends on him, but now he is depending on his parents. He depends on Joseph to go to Egypt and save his life as well. That's a beautiful demonstration of love for us today. Now, let me tell you to complete my message this morning. An illustration. When I was a kid, my mom bought this collection of books of 10 volumes, and it was something like stories of the Bible. And also she bought the other collection of five books with different kind of stories. And we have the task to read one story before we go to bed. I bet, it, I bet many of you did the same. But there's in my mind one story that stuck in my, in my mind forever. I even can close my eyes and I can see the pictures of those pages. And this, this is the story of a little kid who lives near to the lake. Lakes all, they are all fun. Rivers are fun. Ocean is always fun. And during the summer, this little kid used to go with his friends to hang out and play and swim with his friends. But also, the, the, his, his friends used to bring these little wooden boats. And you know, the imagination of a little kid, they believed that it was the Titanic or other, you know, ships. So they put their, in the water the boats, and they can see the boats floating, and they have fun and swim. But the kid of our, of our story, he didn't have one of those boats. So he asked his dad to help him to build one wooden boat. So after work, dad went to the shop with him, cut the wood, they nail it, they glue it, they paint it, they put the sails, and then the boat was ready. So the next day, the little boy went to the lake to do a test, a buoyancy test to see how, how the boat, boat was going to be doing in the water. He was amazed. He put the, the boat in the water, and he was amazed about his creation. He loved that. And he was looking at it, but the wind started to blow stronger and stronger, and then the boat started drifting away from the shore to a place where he couldn't go and grab the boat. He couldn't go. It was too far away. So he decided to go home and ask his dad, maybe dad can go and rescue the boat for me. Next day, when he came back to the lake, the boat was gone. Where is your boat, son? Dad, I don't know. Where is the boat? I saw it yesterday between those branches. But maybe someone took my boat 
or maybe sunken. I don't know where is my body. And the, the kid started to, to cry because it really means a lot for him, that little wooden boat, and went home so sad that night. Next day, mom asked his son to go to the downtown for some shopping. And while he was walking on the main street of the little town, he saw in the big window in the store, the toy store, his boat in the middle of all different beautiful toys. But his boat was in the center of the window with a special light. And then he went inside of the store and asked the man to return his boat. And the person said, sorry, son, this boat is for sale. He went home. He broke his piggy bank collect all the money and savings he had, and promise mom to clean the restroom, do his bed every day in the morning, clean the garden, whatever mom you want to do, just give me the rest of the money to pay for the boat. And then he collect all the money, went to the store, and then he paid the price for that little boat. The person gave it to him, and he hold it in his arms and walk away from the store, and he said the following, now this boat is, boat is mine twice. The first time because I made it. And the second time because I paid the price for this boat. Brothers and sisters, according to the book of Genesis, we were created by God. We are His but also in the cross, Jesus Christ paid a price, a high price for you and me because he loves us so much. But let me tell you something else. We as a Seventh-day Adventists and Christians believe that there is a second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. Amen? Amen. But there is a second coming because we have a high priest in the heaven interceding for us. And there is a high in, in the heaven an intercessor because the resurrection. And there is resurrection because the cross in the Calvary. And there is a cross in the Calvary because this manger. God loves us so much, brothers and sisters. And he gave to us the best. And this commitment is for the eternity. Now, Jesus Christ as a man shares in the heaven the throne of the whole universe. Now we are preparing for the Christmas day. Now maybe we are getting ready for delicious food. Maybe we're going to be giving some beautiful presents and receiving those beautiful presents as well. And have a good time with our families. But I want you to remember something. The most beautiful present was given to us, it was given to you in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the most beautiful present we can have. Therefore, I want to wish to you a Merry Christmas. And while you spend good time with your families, hug your sons, your parents, call that friend or parent who is far away and tell him how much how much you love him or love her. God bless you.